Hi, this is Dr. Kirsten Jeffrey Johnson of the George MacDonald Society and editor of Informing the Inklings, MacDonald and the Roots of Victorian Modern Fantasy, and you are listening to Pints with Jack. Truth is always about something, but reality is that about which truth is. Dr. Charlie Starr, The Lion's Country. This is Pints with Jack, Season 6, Episode 27. The Lion's Country. After Hours with Dr. Charlie W. Starr. <laughs> Welcome everyone here on Pints with Jack. We're reading our way through the works of C.S. Lewis. But as you can already imagine from the episode title, this is an After Hours episode with an incredible guest. And I'm really looking forward to this because I've always... Probably now, in hindsight, wrongly stated that I'm very drawn to truth, and that's a great thing, but there's something beyond truth that uh, we're going to be discussing today, and that could be the real or reality, and you saw that in the quote that I mentioned. You know, That's what truth is about, and so I'm looking forward to this conversation greatly, but before uh, welcoming our guest on the show, a little bit of a background. Dr. Charlie W. Starr is an associate professor of English at Alderson Broadus University in West Virginia. He teaches, writes, and lectures on classic and American literature, film, theology, and on the works of C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien. Dr. Starr is the world's leading expert on the writing of C.S. Lewis, and he is the author of many essays, articles, and books about Lewis, including The Fawn's Bookshelf Light and the work which we'll be talking about today, The Lion's Country. Dr. Charlie Starr, welcome to Pints with Jack. Matt, thank you so much. I'm I'm thrilled to be with you. And I really love that uh, opening quote uh, that you began with. Um, it's brilliantly written, and that's because <laughs> it was not written by me. So yes, it does appear in my book. But it is, in fact, uh, me quoting C.S. Lewis from an essay called Myth Became Fact. Ah, and that would have went over my head because I have not read Myth Became Fact yet. So it's a great little essay. You're going to want to read that. After going through your book, that because you, you referenced that book, uh, Myth Became Fact, quite a yeah. bit, and it made yeah. me realize that is on a very short list of ones that I need to get to here sooner rather than later. You were last on the show in 2021. You talked to David about the Archangel Fragment. So what have you been up to since then? Uh, well, 2022 was an especially good year. While I published The Lion's Country in December, in the previous January of the same year, I was able to publish the third book in my science fiction series. Uh, and that book is called The Aurora Gambit. And this is a series I started in the last millennium, literally, uh, <laughs> called The Tales of Solomon's Star. Um, and there are three books out, and I'm working on the fourth book, and that's where I focused a lot of my writing attention here in the last year. In 2021, in the summer, uh, I visited the Wade Center, and I was doing some work with Lewis's handwriting, going through Lewis's personal library and looking at his annotations. And in that process, I was able to um, discover two unknown C.S. Lewis poems. No uh, so way. that's very exciting. Yeah. When that happens, what is there like an announcement to the Lewis community because of, of this discovery? What, what happens next after that? Well, um, first, you feel like Indiana Jones because you <laughs> discovered the Holy Grail, right? Um, or, or the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, then... Um, you do the research to find out if it is indeed a brand new C.S. Lewis text no one's ever seen before. <laughs> uh, when you're certain that's the case, you might tell a few people. But uh, for the most part, um, you either hold on to it to see if um, you can do something with it later or you um, see about trying to get it published. And publishing mm -hmm. an, a new Lewis document usually involves writing some sort of brief introduction to go along with the document and then publishing it in one of the uh, scholarly journals uh, like Seven, which comes out of the Wade Center, um, mm -hmm. and or Journal of Inkling Studies or Zane Zucht. And uh, so during the last year, I've managed to do one of those poems. I've been working with a colleague over um, across the pond, uh, Sarah Waters, and we are close to submitting um, a poem that Lewis wrote in Latin with mm -hmm. Owen Barfield. Well, um, about Noah and his ark, 
Uh, so we're very close to submitting that. Um, so as of now, it's not been published and no one else is doing anything with it as far as we know. Uh, then the other poem, I'm just, um, I've, I've got it on, on my computer's desktop. If uh, somebody else publishes it first or does something with it first, that's perfectly fine with me. But it is really an interesting poem, <laughs> which Lewis wrote, I think, after Dimer was released in 1926. Probably Lewis wrote this poem in 27. And it is about the fact that Dimer was a failure. <laughs> and he talks about the um, the difficulties of of wanting to be a famous poet, uh, but not not achieving that. And then the funnest thing I've been doing uh, that's uh, Lewis specific is I've gotten together with a group of scholars who are working to try to publish uh, what is now something like or over three hundred unpublished C.S. Lewis letters or letters that don't appear in the three volume collected letters of C.S. Lewis that Walter Hooper published early in the O's. So new letters are found all the time. And what we're working toward is trying to, through the Wade Center, uh, create a situation in which those letters can be uh, accessed and we can continue to add new letters to it. So instead of publishing a hard copy book, we're looking at uh, some sort of a um, online document uh, available through a specific resource in which we publish all these uh, heretofore unpublished Lewis letters. And I get wow. the really enjoyable task of um, making sure the transcriptions are accurate. So I get to look at images of original Lewis manuscripts, compare them to our typed transcription, and make sure that they're accurate. And when you're, when you're a Lewis nerd who loves Lewis documents, uh, this is one of the coolest jobs uh, in the world. When you're reading these new letters that have been identified. I mean, I'm assuming you've read a lot of the ones that are already published. Yeah, I read them all. <laughs> Were there any of these new ones that there was like a new point that you've never seen Lewis make before or – were they more confirmations of the theology and the stuff that he's written to people before? Or was there something that was like, whoa. This yeah, is... we, you do run into new things, actually. Yeah. Um, and it's really quite wonderful, uh, some of the things that uh, we've seen. Certainly, there are repetitions of things yep. and the like. But uh, today, I was reading a letter that Lewis wrote in 1943. That was part of the fun of it. Is I'm not convinced it was written in 43. Uh, there's a December 7th, and then there's a circa 1943 in somebody else's hand. I think it might have been written a couple of years later based on, the, mm. um, based on the handwriting. And so anyway, I was reading the letter, and in the letter, Lewis said that there was a production company in America that wanted to make screw tape into a movie. Uh, and, and of course, it never happened, but I had, I don't think I've ever read that anywhere in Lewis. I may be wrong, but I don't think I've read that anywhere. Huh. And he said a couple other things about film that I thought were really interesting. I wonder why no one's made, turned that into a movie now, given how popular it is. Well, it should be, shouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, before we dive into the episode, um, I usually have a glass of scotch, but we're recording. I'm a very early to bed person, and I want to get a very good night's sleep. So I'm just drinking Spindrift, which is just a sparkling water. Do you have anything you're enjoying in this conversation? Yes, I have a C.S. Lewis sized cup of Southern sweet tea, mm. uh, bringing the best, bringing together the best of the UK and the best of the USA, uh, right there. Well, That's cheers to that, David. Cheers. Will be proud. You've been on the podcast before, but uh, we've probably have a lot of new listeners since then. So I'd love to just start really high level of how you came across uh, Lewis in the first place. You have a love for him. You have a passion for him. You've written about him. You know, when did you first encounter him and how has he impacted your life? I uh, was at a uh, Christian college in my freshman year um, in 1981. I took an apologetics class. One of the books we had to read was Mere Christianity. So that was my first exposure to C.S. Lewis. Um, then that summer, so it would be the summer um, after, summer of 82, after my full freshman year, I read um, all seven Chronicles of Narnia in probably a three-week period <laughs> and um, really enjoyed them. And off and on that, I read uh, bits and pieces of Lewis for a very long time. He certainly did influence me, 
but the the biggest influence, or, or when I f- truly fell in love with Lewis, though I again I had read several Lewis texts, uh, that came more in the 1990s. So over a decade later, when I finally read Till We Have Faces, uh. and Till We Have Faces changed everything, because you know here I felt like was a a level of literature that could put Lewis against any 20th century writer and say, yeah, this guy can do all that too. Uh, And he's a great, he's a great, great writer. Uh, So at that point I decided to fall in love with Lewis. Um, Also then in the mid nineties, I moved from being a high school teacher to being a college teacher, which required then that I, at that time I had a master's that required I, I needed to get a doctorate. And that was an opportunity then for me to want to write a doctoral dissertation that focused on C.S. Lewis. Uh, so from that forward, I became enamored with doing Lewis scholarship, with writing about Lewis, with reading Lewis, with teaching Lewis classes. Um, and I've been teaching Lewis since 1996. Uh, so all of that just wonderful. And I'd say the biggest influence in terms of my knowledge base, in terms of um, what Lewis did, has done for me intellectually, he did not introduce me to the concept of imagination. Uh, as being epistemologically significant, as being significant for our theory of knowledge, but he Christianized it for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, that that idea, probably more than any other idea, the significance of imagination toward knowing has been uh, Lewis's biggest influence on me. And it's probably why I, you know, I wrote a book on Lewis and myth, since imagination mm-hmm. is so significant to understanding myth. Well, you know... Uh, Andrew very well. Do you guys get together and talk about Till We Have Faces quite frequently? Because I know we have a we have a running debate on this podcast of of Till We Have Faces versus The Great Divorce. Um, <laughs> and David and I are getting beat down left and right. I think uh, every guest that comes on affirms Andrew's side, but we're still trying to stand up in round ten. I suppose I've got to yeah side with Andrew. <laughs> In the sense that, in saying that, with with till we have faces, we get a a marriage of reason and imagination, where Lewis far more successfully shows than says. And with the Great Divorce, there is maybe just a little hint of something more allegorical. Not that it's an allegory at all, and and neither is Narnia. But Great Divorce is a theological novel. And it seems to me Till We Have Faces is a novel uh, that's undergirded by a theology. Uh, So Till We Have Faces is, for me, pure literature in that it Mm -hmm. shows more than it says. And it's it's in that literature, with maybe accepting some of his poems, where he is the most successful at getting his theology and, and philosophy out of the way is the wrong term for it, the, uh, um, subsuming them to the story, letting the story be the mm-hmm. story. Uh, so if you go to Experiment and Criticism, where Lewis talks about how books are two things, they are a logos and a poema. I've always felt like the most successful literature is the literature that emphasizes more the poema than mm-hmm. the logos, the experience that it's in, that you're intended to go through than any message being spoken. So um, I think Till We Have Faces is the most successful book at doing that. Don't tell David this, but after reading your book, Till We Have Faces, it made me want to reread Till We Have Faces because you do reference it quite a bit. And the discussion you had in here, and there's so much more than what I'm about to say, but the discussion you had in Till We Have Faces with the encounter with the real and it being the answer, like in her journey relative to Psyche's, I knew it to some degree, but when I went through Till We Have Faces for this, I went through it very raw. I had read a bunch of works. Andrew brought out a lot of the scholarly side to it, and so did David. I went more as like the, the casual reader who's never read this before. And so since then, I've come across a lot of stuff, and yours particularly. I was like, man, I need to reread Till We Have Faces because I miss so much. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. It's good. And of course, The Great Divorce is a, is, is a great book. What an amazing vision of heaven that, that Lewis presents there. The, the idea that the spiritual world is more real mm. and this world is more like Shadowlands. It stands in such contrast to 
our modern metaphors in which we think of spiritual things as somehow less real. Yes. Uh, and he turns that on, on end, and boy, did it need to be turned. So it is. it truly is great. And it's such a good... I was actually just at drinks with a friend last night, and we were talking about the great divorce. In exactly what you just said, it presents a why for Christianity. It's not just a morality. It's not just right or wrong. It's like the vision of becoming more substantial, becoming more real is a very attractive why. And thinking of yourself is like shallow and becoming deeper or or ghostly and becoming more substantial. Like that draws me in. Mm-hmm. And I think it really does do an incredible job. And that's also tying this back to the interview or this conversation we're about to have is why I really liked uh, your book, The Lion's Country here, because it's so much about that encounter. And so let's actually jump in with uh, the motivation you had for writing this book. I mean, what you, you've you got this whole journey uh, with Lewis, and now you're at this point where you're like, what comes to you thinking I want to write this book? And what was your hope for someone like myself reading it first time to take away from it? Well, let me, let me back up again to when I, when I was working on my doctorate. Yeah. Like you, I've always been fascinated by truth. And to come across Lewis's statement that, you know, reality is that about which truth is, was shocking for me. Uh, And the more I studied Lewis, the the more I realized that his passion wasn't as much for truth as for what truth represented, what truth Mm -hmm. was about, was that it was about the real. All of that came to a head in my doctoral work when I got the opportunity to write a dissertation on one sentence in Paralandra. And that's one that sentence. Yeah, one three hundred and fifty <laughs> pages on one sentence in Paralander. All right, and that's that sentence. I should have it memorized word for word. It's, it's <laughs> crazy that I don't. That's that sentence that says that Ransom was coming to realize that the triple distinction of truth from myth and both with, from fact was part and parcel with the fall and might not have any meaning outside the terrestrial realm. So first of all, I wanted to know what Lewis meant by the difference between fact and truth because I'd never been taught that there was a difference between them. And then I wanted to know how myth could be true, how myth could be real. And then I wanted to know in what state of being might it be possible that those three things become um, undistinct, Mm. that they meld together into a single thing. So I wrote the dissertation and, and then I never published the dissertation. But a few years ago, I went back to it just to look at what I had said about myth. And I gathered the myth material and said, well, let's see what we can do with this. And the result was the Fawn's Bookshelf. And then in um, the summer of COVID, right, I was sitting around with nothing to do because all my teaching gigs had been canceled. (laughs) And I I said, well, you know, I, I did the stuff with the myth. I wonder if I could take the chapters on reality in my dissertation and turn them into something. So I started in June to see if I could put together a book on Lewis and reality. And it faltered in July, where I just didn't see myself being able to translate what I had done in my dissertation to a single book. And then near the end of August, or middle of August, as the new semester was about to begin, uh, suddenly I had a, a, a divine inspiration or, or, or something from the Lord, I guess. And, I, I suddenly could see a book on Lewis and the real, a complete book. Mm-hmm. And so then it was just another half a year or so of, of working on finishing it out, getting the writing done, getting permission to quote that beautiful passage on heaven that's at the end of the book and, uh, and getting it uh, knocked out. So part of my motivation was this, this long-term interest in Lewis's epistemology. Mm-hmm. Part of it then was, material I had already written about reality, but then a big chunk of it was you know, time and place, the ripeness of the time, uh, given the summer of COVID when I uh, was sitting at home and needed something to to work on. And this is the thing that, that took my fancy. Well, I did not realize this. And I think I saw you had printed out the, the questions uh, that I had 
um, prepared. So you probably can't see. I threw one extra one in uh, this today as I was going back through. And it was literally that quote, Ransom had a revelation in a fallen world, myth, truth, and fact, lose distinction. I had no idea that was a sentence that your entire dissertation was on. But I was going back through, I got your book on the Kindle and I underlined a whole bunch of stuff as I'm reading in preparation. I was just going back through the quotes that I had done. I'm like, that's a good one. Let me just loop that in here last minute. Yeah, that's great. And uh, that's hilarious. Um, so I'm really glad that that actually glad that that stuck out to me because it did seem like a very significant statement. Well, and I think it is significant. Um, and this may this may help us with some of the questions that you're going to ask. Yeah. In terms of understanding the scholarship of Lewis, of Lewis's epistemology, because for yeah. the longest time, and this is primarily Lewis's fault. Scholars have looked at Lewis's ideas on knowledge by focusing on reason and imagination. Um, and reason is easily connected to concepts of truth. Imagination is easily connected to myth. And this dualistic approach has made for some understandings about Lewis's epistemology, which haven't been complete. And mm. what was missing was the element of fact. Uh, which for Lewis is the experience of fact. When we experience reality, uh, we also gain knowledge. And so this tripartite approach to Lewis's epistemology, which I took, and which other scholars that like to focus on on Lewis's theory of knowledge um, are starting to take, that tripart approach is yielding better fruit, I think, especially in our understanding that what, what Lewis was enamored of was not just knowledge and not just truth, but he was enamored of the real. And, and eventually, a, a, a German Lewis scholar named Norbert Feinendegen is going to publish a 600-page tome on Lewis's total philosophical thought in which he takes an approach that does emphasize the importance of experience in Lewis's theory of knowledge. And he associates imagination with experience as well as with myth. Uh, so uh, it's been published in German, but who reads German, right? So I've I've been able to read a, um, a a version in English, and Norbert is just shopping it around to find the right publisher for it right now. So when that comes out, everybody's going to want to need to get that and, and take a look at that. Who's interested in this topic? I love it. And is this this makes me think of in Mere Christianity? He has that that discussion or the the, the section that's about theology. It's the map that you can of the ocean or being at the edge of the ocean. So like experiencing it, reading it. Could this be a way of extending that? I mean, like you read a novel of someone venturing in the ocean. You can read a map where you can actually be there and experience it. So you've got like the the story, the myth, the map, which is kind of like the... The reason side. Yep, the reason side. And then you've got the fact of like just experiencing it straight up. Yourself, um, yes. Okay. I remember that section. I always liked that section. Um well, before as we as we dive into this and, and how Lewis got to this, um, before doing that, we've sort of touched on it already. But can you just distinguish what you mean by truth, reality, myth? Just so we the language when they keep hearing us talk about truth and how how they relate and differ from each other. All right. So again, part of the problem is Lewis b- believes that there is a place where truth, reality, and myth become one and the same, and that's mm. in the heavenly realm. So when we talk about Lewis and truth. Um, what I'm going to say will actually only be partially correct um, <laughs> because he uses the word differently, depending. But that said, for Lewis, reality or fact is what is. And there are multiple levels of reality. There's a hierarchy. Um, there also might be what I kind of call a horizontal hierarchy, for lack of a better term. Uh, it is the idea that there might be multiverses. Mm-hmm. Um and we can get to them all through the wood between the world uh, in Magician's Nephew, right? But each, like, to go into the wood from our world and then into the Narnian world is not to go from one planet in our universe to another planet. It's to go from an entire, uh, from one complete universe to a completely different universe. Uh, so Lewis was doing multiverse theory before multiverse theory was cool uh, <laughs> in terms of uh, what he was writing. And, of course, you see that in his uncompleted novel, The Dark Tower. Where there's, uh, where there's parallel universes, parallel worlds uh, working. So reality is what is, but there's also a sense in which reality has an ought element. Mm-hmm. A reality is what ought to be. That is, there's a moral element to reality. 
But that reality, what Lewis called the Tao in The Abolition of Man, is just as real as what we take normally as just physical facts. Um, these moral facts for Lewis are also facts. They are just as real and just as concrete. So uh, for Lewis, though, then, reality is what is. Now, truth, except in the heavenly realms, uh, and there's this great line in The Great Divorce where the the angelic spirit, the human spirit is talking to the ghostly theologian, and the mm -hmm. theologian says, you know, inquiry, inquiry is all that matters, right? The search for truth. And his friend says, no, that's not right. If if searching and not finding were true, and you knew that to be true, you could never search hopefully. Uh, and and you've, you, you believe that because so far you've only encountered truth in the abstract. I'm going to take you to where you can be embraced by it as by a lover and where you can drink it like water. Bad paraphrase, but it's something like that. So, <laughs> so say it this way. On earth, if you will, for C.S. Lewis, truth is something that happens inside our heads. Truth is when what we know about reality corresponds to reality. If what we know about reality does correspond, we know truth. If what we know does not correspond, then our thinking is false. Uh, so it's not entirely inside our heads, because the reality itself is, is the determiner of the truth. But it is very much about our knowledge. And for Lewis, then, um, on earth at least, truth is incredibly abstract. It is abstract means separated from. Uh, abstract is a step back from the real, not the same thing as the real. It can be about the real, but it's not the real itself until we meet truth, the person. And thus, um, there's a moment where truth enters the world as fact, and his name is Jesus Christ. And he descends from the mythic world of heaven, so I'll talk about myth in a second. He comes into our world, and then when Pontius Pilate meets him, and he says, I've come to um, provide testimony for the truth, uh, to witness to the truth, Pilate says, what is truth? And Jesus doesn't answer. That's because he is the answer. It's like till we right? have faces. That wonderful ending of till we have faces, before him all, all questions die away, mm. right? So he is the answer, and Pilate misses it. Uh, so we could talk perhaps in terms of capital T truth, a heavenly truth, which is concrete reality. A little t, the little t truths we encounter here in this world, we encounter as abstractions. And so Lewis will say that our ability to think, our ability to reason is incurably abstract. In uh, And I think he says that in letters to Malcolm. We're incurably abstract. Well, there is a cure, but it's not in this world. It's to be found in the next world. All right. So for the most part, not 100%, but for the most part, reality is what is for C.S. Lewis. Truth is about reality. It's when our knowledge of reality is accurate. Myth, then, is something that is perceived in the imagination, something that comes across to us in story, uh, and something meant to point us to a kind of higher reality, but in the incarnational embodiment in story. Hmm. And doing it then not so much by being words that are spoken and truth statements, but by being a story that we encounter as if the reality within that story is something to experience. We experience that reality. We experience what oral experiences, um, or even what the Pevensey children experience, and we encounter Something that super reality is a silly term for, but that might come close. We, we encounter a level of the real that we might almost say is behind the real that you and I see on a normal basis. Uh, some sort of, we could talk about platonic essences. <laughs> uh, we could talk about archetypes. You could. I'm not sure I can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we could talk about archetypes. We could talk about uh, truth on an ontological level. 
a reality on an ontological level, myth is able somehow to show us that world, mm. to show us uh, a, a heavenly reality, to show us a reality that might have been part of our world if there hadn't been a fall. And that's, that's about as close as I can get, at least at this moment, to saying what myth is. There's so many different questions this is this could be pushing me towards. Because you've talked about, is it fair to say, when you're talking about myth here, we've already t- touched on until we have faces, that's really doing that, what you're describing, if, I've, if I'm understanding it correctly. Like when I was reading that, I felt like I was learning something about reality in a, in a different way than I, I, I'm typically drawn towards, and it's changing, thankfully. I'm typically drawn towards mere Christianity. Just spit out the truth to me. Just tell me right. what I need to know, the, the, yep. the facts. Just give me that. And I'm not usually a myth person. And I think that's why the first time when Till We Have Faces, I read it, I didn't get as much. And then I read it a second time. And now I'm going again to a third time. And, and Out of the Silent Planet's done something as well in that sense where I'm, I'm seeing the power of that form of bringing reality in a way that I didn't five years ago. And so it's been really beautiful. Yeah, that's good. There's a there's a there's a sacramental quality to it, Ooh, I love an, that an word. incarnational quality to it. To think sacrament, you know, Jesus says, "This is my body, this is my blood," and we've been mm-hmm. arguing theologically then about what that means forever. <laughs> but if it, what if it simply means what it is in some mythic way, a way that's not meant to be understood rationally, intellectually, but can only be understood in story and the experience of the Eucharist itself. Mm. Sacrament seems to be the place where that which is literal and that which is figurative are categories that no longer exist, are categories Mm. that fall apart. And the literal and the figurative come together in in the sacraments, in whether that's communion or or, or baptism or or whatever other sacraments, depending on our churches, that there is this there is this place where heaven and earth touch, and even our even some of our very categories of thought then fall apart. The interesting thing about myth then is it's communicating to you without any sense of abstraction. Mm-hmm. It's communicating to you in a con- concrete form. So if I say, well, what does till we have faces mean? If I start to analyze it and talk about meanings, I am allegorizing, I am abstracting, I am saying what it's about rather than what it is. Now, there's nothing wrong with doing this. Otherwise, people like me who teach English would be out of a job. (laughs) We need to talk about the meanings of the text, but meaning itself isn't always something that could be put into words. And this is something C.S. Lewis will say in his... um, short piece, The Language of Religion, where he talks about there being three kinds of of language. Average, normal language, it's cold outside. Scientific language, it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit outside. Or poetic language, ah, bitter chill it was, right? Or as I like to share with my students, man, it's just it's colder out there than a chihuahua on the South Pole. <laughs> uh, and then and, and at the I end like of that, that. Lewis essay, Lewis says something absolutely amazing. He says, most of what we experience can only be communicated through hints, metaphors, poetic language. And myth is perhaps the most concrete kind of of that language. And, and Lewis will talk about this in a couple of places, one of them being in Preface to Paradise Lost. Myth is, and I, I made up this term, myth is a mode of languaging. Hmm. It is not the words we use to express the myth. Lewis talks about that in his introduction to the George MacDonald anthology that he put together. The very objects within the myth, the very plot of the myth is the language being spoken. Giants, elves, hobbitses, tr- you know, trees, journeys, underworlds, caves. And then each of those is not the thing only, but it is the word being expressed singly in, in that moment. It is a sentence. And as it interacts in a plot, that plot is also sentence. But it's not in the words, it's in the language. And the first way to receive a myth then always is to get yourself out of the way 
and simply experience it as as mythic reality, the way we ex- we would experience anything in you know in life. Uh, so take take the idea of of being in love. When you're in love, you can't think straight, and it's very hard for you to think. Well, why am I in love with this person? And then make a smart decision about whether or not you're going to marry this person, uh, because you're too busy being in love, right? Mm-hmm. Eventually, you can step back and think about the experience of being in love. Lewis says it this way in The Myth Became Fact essay. He says, you can either laugh at a joke or you can think about why it's funny. (laughs) As soon as you start thinking about why it's funny, it's not funny anymore. Uh Myth is something you, you should experience first before you think about any message it's trying to give. You have to experience it first because myth is the message that it's trying to give. And only then when you step back and start thinking about it and and abstracting out of it, can you make that message more clear for your reason. Apparently in heaven, this wouldn't be a problem. But here on earth in what Lewis calls the valley of abstraction, the veil abstractionis in Myth Became Fact, it is a problem. And we, we kind of just, we have to deal with the fact that we have this bifurcated approach to knowledge. We're going through right now in this season out of the silent planet, this framework of, of reality or fact, truth, myth, how can we apply this to out of the silent planet, you know, as, as, as readers? One of the things that out of the silent planet is, is pointing us to is the understanding that sometimes our imaginative experiences can lie to us. Mm. You know, I came to Lewis looking for a great champion to imagination. And what I found is a man who understood that imagination is both wonderful and incredibly dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, and I talk, that, I talk about that in the Fawn's bookshelf uh, more than I do in the reality, uh, the reality book. But Screwtape talks about messing with people's imaginations, right? And Lewis talks about imagination, the danger of imagination in an essay called Horrid Red Things. In that essay, he talks about having overheard a conversation between a mother and a child. And the mother says to the child, you shouldn't eat too many aspirins. They're poisonous. And the child says, why? When you, when you break them open, they don't have any horrid red things inside them. So the child understood what poison is and that you shouldn't do poison. But she also had, uh, so that was her correct idea, but she also had a false image. She thought poison was horrid red things. Uh, Right idea, wrong image. So Ransom comes to uh, to the silent planet with wrong images in his head. And the images came from H.G. Wells, War of the Worlds, and and other early science fiction writers who who said, when the aliens come, they will come to try to conquer. They will be the bad guys. We will be the good guys. And they will be gross and ugly and mechanical and bug-like. And so when Ransom gets to Mars, right, he, uh, Malachandra, he's, he's first of all shocked by the fact that the planet is beautiful because mm-hmm. he didn't expect it to be beautiful based on the books that he had read. His imagination had been falsely trained. And so what he has to do is he has to go through concrete experience. He has to experience the planet itself. He has to encounter the aliens there and find that they are very nice, that they are wonderful, that in fact, people from Earth are the true invaders Mm. and and the Martians are the good guys. Um, And he, he, he can't learn that by being told it. He has to learn it by experiencing it. And only after uh, the right number of, of um, experiences is he able then to learn any kind of truth that comes through a conversation with uh, his various friends or with the Oyarsa of Mars. So the cure for Ransom's miseducated imagination, and therefore the cure for his fear, is for him to go through a series of experiences that help um, retrain his imagination to understand the beauty of this alien world uh, but then it also forces him into situations where he has to practice courage. But then, of course, what's what's shocking about the whole thing is just as Lewis is telling us about the danger of imagination, 
he is also working on healing our broken imaginations using an imaginative text. In other words, it's true that Ransom has to go through experiences of reality, but the reality is completely fictional. It's completely imaginary, right? Uh, and, and we have this tendency, we, we, we tend to say, if something is imaginary, it's not real. Isn't that what that term means, right? It's imaginary. Mm -hmm. It's not real. And if it's not real, then it's not true. And I think that's wrong. I think that's what we've been taught since the Enlightenment about the nature of imagination, that the imagination has no epistemological value. Yeah. But what C.S. Lewis understood is that just as the imagination could be used to teach bad thinking, it could be used to bring people into right thinking into right understandings um, about the nature of, of, of things. So fictional reality, as much as a, of an oxymoron as that is, is absolutely important for teaching us knowledge about the real. It can be used for truth, as in the in case of the Narnia books, but it could be used for lies, as in the case of um, Pullman's Golden Compass. Uh, in his attempt to, you know, reject um, any kind of theism and and promote atheism, uh, so the imagination is a, a a wonderfully curious thing, and and Lewis explains it very specifically in a little essay called "Blustfuls and Philanspheries." I've never heard of that. It's it's wonderfully strange, it. and if you <laughs> want to read it, you can you can still find it published today in a book called "Selected Literary Essays." Okay. And Blusswells is about how language operates metaphorically um, and how metaphorical language turns into dead metaphors, which we then take literally. But the the most important passage in Blusswells, the most quoted passage, occurs at the end where, where Lewis says he believes that reason is the organ of truth. Hmm. But he says that imagination is the organ of meaning. Imagination is the only thing that makes our ability to know truth possible. But he also says imagination, meaning, is the source of either truth or falsehood. So there's a certain neutral quality to imagination in Lewis's epistemology. Um, imagination is where we create meanings. All right. So if I say the word cow, you are capable of attaching that word to um, an animal that we get milk from. That is an act of imagination. All right? You have understood a meaning. Hmm. If I say the sky is plaid, that is also a meaning, but it's a false meaning. <laughs> all right? But the imagination is what makes meaning possible at all. Um, and then there, and then for Lewis, there are many kinds of meanings. Again, some meanings, like in myth, which aren't even spoken in words. And, that, and that's another thing we need to correct in our modern thinking. If I ask you, what does that mean? You almost certainly are going to give me an explanation in words. Hmm. There are meanings that are completely apart from language. Uh, thus, for example, the husband who looks at his wife and sees what I'm going to refer to as the look. And that's the look that tells you you're in trouble. No words <laughs> needed whatsoever. That's one of the ways that meaning functions. There can be unconscious meanings. I can remember my daughter getting scared at a movie, a cartoon we were watching. In fact, it was a cartoon version of The Princess and the Goblin, George MacDonald. <laughs> she was getting scared while we were watching it. She was about four. And I said, why are you scared? And she didn't know. What it was, was that there was suspense music playing. And already at that age, she had come to understand that music had meaning apart from the words in music. And that when a certain kind of music was playing, uh, something scary was about to happen in the movie that we were going to watch. And that's only possible because meaning is not something associated only with language. Meaning is something associated with imagination. Imagination is what makes language possible at all. It's what makes meaning possible at all. But then imagination is what can make truth or falsehood 
true meanings or false meanings possible. And so Lewis understood this dual quality of imagination, and therefore he also understood the importance of teaching to the imagination so that people could encounter not so much truth as the real through concrete imaginative experiences. We have a thing on the podcast where we do like slow clap worthy with a really good response and it only gets whipped out once every like three or four months. You've officially convinced me of the power of myth and the role that it can play in bringing the real. Awesome. That was very well said. I mean, nice. it, I actually could feel what you were describing, putting words to when I went through out of the silent planet before I even really understood. So I read it first in preparation for the season before I read um, Christina Hale's book, before I read uh, Diana Glyer's collection of essays that she put together and edited. So I didn't really know a lot about the the truth that Lewis was communicating to it. But the myth itself was opened me up to a reality that I was living a little bit differently from. Like the way I was kind of describing it is I was really drawn to the beauty of what kind of appeared to me, I'm using naive language here, but like is this unfallen world, this beautiful way of living with creation. And even though I knew this was just a story, it was tapping to something real inside of me and showing me how the falsehoods in my life, to be frank, and then drawing me to something more beautiful. And then as I started to read this other stuff and realize also some of the other direct truth that was, that was as well. But like just the story itself resonated something within me. Um, and so I, I, I'm definitely going to actually go back and read Till We Have Faces uh, here in 2023 now because that one Absolutely. I think does a lot of what you just described. Well, and the way you just described your, your response um, to Out of the Silent Planet is, is perfect. I mean, you really are receiving it as myth. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I could tell from the way you described it, you are receiving it as myth. And of course, that was the key moment that brought Lewis to his conversion, wasn't it? Um, ah. In that great conversation with Tolkien and Dyson in 1931, um, yeah. Lewis had been thinking about Christianity, but he had not been receiving it as myth because he, he thought myth did, at that time, he thought myth had no connection to truth. Hmm. And Tolkien taught him otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> Tolkien taught him that it actually did, um, and that changed everything for him. When he was able to look at Christ as a myth, that just happened to also occur in reality. That changed everything. He was able to overcome abstraction, receive concrete reality, the concrete reality of Christ as he, as he was in history, and uh, become a Christian. I have so many thoughts and I've never seen an hour fly by so fast <laughs> in a conversation. And you're connecting everything in my head right now, which is great. So what I want to do with this is bring it to actually what you just did here sort of at the end with what you're talking about with Christ. So we've talked about myth. We've talked about fact. We've talked about um, uh, truth. But let's, connecting this to just an everyday life, me, you, the listener on the other side of this. You know, we've been talking about this with relation to Lewis, how the silent planet, till we have faces, all this other stuff. Understanding what you are, this picture you are painting of these three things and, and articulating that Lewis is doing so well. As, as a regular person, is it safe for me to say that the ultimate goal is for us to be in communion with reality, to experience reality? But truth in myth, and in, in we we're in a fallen world. I'm having a hard time articulating, but we're in a fallen world. We're not in an unfallen world yet. And so these are, as you said, there is a distinction at this stage, but that distinction gets lost when we're in a non-fallen world and presumably, hopefully, Lord willing, with in communion with God in heaven. So in this world today, what can we do as listeners, as, as people, to get us closer to that non-fallen world? Is it reading the right myths? Is it is it just getting a nice plethora of making sure we're reading the right myths, experiencing the sacramental life, encountering truth? I'm going to see if there's a way that you can bring this all together and bring it home for like our everyday life. Like what do we do with this? Yeah, right. I just danced around a lot there, but that's – Yeah. <laughs> well, and I really think you, you, you've given the answer. If, if reason is our access point to truth because mm -hmm. imagination can be – steered in wrong directions, then some good philosophy and some good theology are still good for us. We need to 
expose ourselves to the good thinkers, uh, to the good thoughts. We need to stay in the word. We need to follow the signs as, as Jill is taught to do in the silver chair. The silver chair is very much a book about epistemology, uh, about knowledge. So we've, we've, we've got to stay in the word. Um, we've got to listen to the great preachers. We've got to read the great thinkers. And then we've got to read great stories. And I'd say that's probably my emphasis in speaking to fellow Christians, is especially Protestant Christians who have sort of lost their theology of imagination. Um, sometimes the best truths are going to come across through stories. Um, they're going to come across to your kids that way, which is why we've got to be reading great stories to our children, especially stories of fairy tales, which somehow do capture higher reality in these mythic tales that that are made up of the stuff of lower reality. Mm. We, we've got to expose ourselves to good stories. We've got to expose our kids to good stories. Those are our motivation. Story is our motivation. Heroes are our motivation to want to be better people. You can tell me that it is right for me, if I'm a college-age man, to be a virgin until I get married. You can tell me that it's right. Mm -hmm. But unless you can show me that it's cool, that is, unless you can teach my imagination to delight in celibacy somehow, all right, unless you can get me back to the Arthurian knights like Galahad, who was able to unhorse uh, Lancelot because Galahad was more chaste, right, mm. and had true power because he had self-control, until we can create images that show just how cool morality is, we're not going to be as motivated as simply being told that morality is, you know, what the morals a are. phenomenal example. Right. Um, so that's important. The more we can, and of course, Jesus spoke in parables in part for that reason, but also to put us through experiences, not just to teach us um, truths, um, but to combine those two. Then we also need to experience life. We need to experience the world God has given us here because this world is the metaphor for the spiritual reality that is above this world. All the experiences we have in life, all the beauty we have in life, can point us to the divine if we're willing to let it. But if we withdraw from the world and, 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 and live only inside our own heads, then we're practicing what I think Lewis saw as the end result uh, uh, for hell. Lewis once described those souls left in hell using the word leavings. That is, when mm -hmm. you take away the reason, the ability to reason, because reason is a good, reason doesn't exist in hell. When you take away the ability to think clearly, when you take away the senses and leave only a mind within itself, that's what's going to be left of the human soul in hell. God created us to be sens sensuous creatures, uh, to be creatures who can praise him through, because there are things that we can see, taste, touch, feel um, here that the angels can't, right? Do angels know what coffee tastes like? <laughs> uh, but but human beings can can praise God for the taste of coffee. Mm -hmm. So we need to experience life. We need to be involved in life. Lewis talked about the importance of encountering right pleasures and experiencing right pleasures. And he has this great story then in Screw Tape, where Screw Tape says you don't have to tempt someone with uh, here I'll modernize it with sex, drugs, and rock and roll <laughs> if you can just tempt them with TikTok videos right? With small, tiny pleasures. And Screwtape tells the story then of, of one of his patients who, upon first entering hell, realized that not only did he not do what he ought to have done in life, but he also didn't do what he wanted to do in life. It's the best part. True good pleasures always call us to God, not away from him. Mm -hmm. All right? So to experience that level of reality, uh, that's, that's good for us. Um, to start to turn my TV off and actually go for a walk, mm -hmm. right? To go through the hard work of writing my next novel instead of just watching somebody else's creativity or, or you know, on, on television or something like that. But it also means then having this moral element. 
in terms of how I conduct my life and in terms of how I love other people in the real world, right? There's the moral element and the el- and the love element. Okay, um, you know Christ said, and I'm and I'm butchering this paraphrase, or um, and I can't even remember where it's from. Christ said, "If you want to know me, you're going to obey my commandments." Hmm. And then in First John, First John four eight, right? John says, "The one who 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 does not love does not know God, for God is love." So to love is an element of reality. Uh, to love in reality is an element of knowledge. And so we have to incarnate truth into the world. We have to bring reality, we have to experience reality in the world, and then we have to have experiences of doing the right things and of loving people in the world. All right. So all of those are elements of a total and complete knowledge, right? Of making sacrifices in life, of enjoying right pleasures in life, of being involved with real human beings uh, in life, not just dinking around on Facebook, but actually having a conversation, even if it is a virtual conversation like the one you and I are having, but to have yeah. real conversations with real people. You're filling me up right now. <laughs> yeah, to um, to enjoy great stories and great art, to experience beauty in nature as well as man-made beauty. And get that mythic quality even from you know a, a, a sunrise or, or from seeing the Grand Canyon. Well, that's not just a big hole in the ground. It's it's this mythic majesty that God God dug out right over there in uh, in Arizona, right? It's Arizona, right? No. <laughs> Nevada. Okay. Anyway, I'm literally wondering if it's Nevada, or Arizona. All right. So one one of those places. Little <laughs> I'm humility. geographically challenged. I Google Maps in my 20 minute town wherever I go. I have no idea where I'm going. And then pursuing good thinking and not doing that by yourself. I want to I want to read my Bible and read the thoughts of those there, but I don't want to interpret my Bible entirely by myself. I want to be part of a community, part of a, uh, whether it's a church, my Sunday school, or my Wednesday night Bible study, or the community, great Christian thinkers that stretches back 2,000 years. Uh, thinkers like C.S. Lewis who gather us together to do what we're doing right now to learn in that way. So it's this mix of of imagination and experiencing the real and at reasoning, acting with 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 holiness and love, all of this together. And then experiencing we can add experiencing God through prayer and, and who knows what other supernatural means he may communicate with us. Uh, the total act of living our lives of living our stories and thinking about them as we go along, that I think is what draws all of this all of this together and anchors us in a God who could only find one perfect name for himself, which was I am reality. I am. Mm. I be being existence. That's what God is. And so to get caught up in the real is to get caught up ever more towards God. Unbelievable answer to that question. When I was asking, I'm like, there's been so much wisdom in this conversation. How do we bring this home? I was struggling that, to phrase the question, and you just nailed it and stuck the landing. All right. That was fantastic. All right. Praise the Lord. I'm going to ask this listener submitted question. He asked the question. He says, I'm just reading it verbatim. You did a, a good job throughout the book avoiding overly technical language, which is useful for the lay reader and overall lover of Lewis. Inspired by Lewis's practice of simplifying for the sake of understanding, how would you describe the importance of Lewis's metaphysical views to those who would never pick up a book, struggle reading, or have never read Lewis? Okay, let, let me try two answers um, mm-hmm. to that question. The first one is that Lewis's beliefs point us to the correct satisfaction of our longings, because Mm. we all have longing. Uh, And Lewis uses a few illustrations for this. Uh, One is ducks, all right? Ducks want to swim. From, from, From the time they're born, they want to swim. Well, thankfully, there's water. 
Mm. And so water exists to fulfill that longing. A rumbling stomach makes me want to eat. That's that's a moment of longing. I, I want to eat. Now, wanting to eat won't necessarily prove that I will get to eat. <laughs> I might be in a country where people are starving. Mm-hmm. But the fact that I want to eat is proof that food exists somewhere in the world. Otherwise, I'd never find it. But Lewis says then we have a deep, deep longing for something. And we go around looking for it, trying to fulfill it. And everything we think is going to fulfill it fails, whether it's romance, fame, a career, writing the great American novel, which I still haven't achieved. Dang it. All right. Um, we long for, for something that will fulfill us, that will make us whole and complete. And we never seem to find it on earth. But if the longing exists, there must be a fulfillment somewhere. And so Lewis says, if I find in myself a longing for something which nothing in this world can satisfy, the best conclusion from that is that I must have been meant for another world. And you want to talk metaphysics. There you're talking Mm -hmm. metaphysics. All right. That other world, that undiscovered country, that land of Narnia, those Tolkien-esque white shores, and beyond the far Greek country under a swift sunrise, (laughs) that's the world that we're really longing for. And then another thing that I might suggest is another wonderful Lewis metaphor, which he says in a number of different places. In Christianity, he is finally able to envision a complete world system. All the questions can get answered. All the parts can be put into place. And he says it this way. I believe in Christianity like I believe the sun has risen. Not just because I see it, but by it, I see everything else. All right. So so Christianity, which is metaphysical in its inherent nature, isn't just the thing that Lewis believed in, but by looking through the lens of Christianity, it made it possible for him to see how everything else fit in its place. Mm -hmm. It gave him a total picture of the real. I'm really glad you answered that. And I want to leave it in actually, because I totally forgot. I was really just flowing with our conversation. So I wasn't really looking at my questions throughout this conversation. And longing was something that I did want to dive into. And we, we, yeah. we, we're, we'll wrap it up here. But you just you brought it in beautifully right there. And I love it because that was such an important part of the book. And so Thanks. that worked out very well. That's <laughs> we got it in there. Yeah. So Dr. Charlie Sartre, thank you for coming on to the show. And as the landlord rings the bells for final drinks, can you please tell people where they can find out more about you, uh, your your materials, books, particularly copy at Alliance Country, uh, just anything you'd like to share? Sure. The last two uh, C.S. Lewis books have come out of Kent State and mm-hmm. can be found there. But the easiest way to find them is to go to Amazon uh, and plug in the book titles. To see uh, more of the work that I've done, you can type in Charlie W. Star and find my author page. Now, it will be important then to add that extra W. So Charlie W. Star, star with two R's. If you type that in, you'll see a list of a variety of different books that I've written on Lewis, um, uh, fiction and fantasy, uh, some Bible studies. And um, if you want to find out any more about me than that, maybe just send me an email and ask. So, And I don't mind giving my email for those who really want to have a conversation about something that matters to you. And my email is starcw at ab.edu. So star with two R's, Mm -hmm. then C and W at ab.edu. That's a great, just ab.edu. Yeah, for (laughs) Alvis and Broadus where I work. Yes, I love it. So again, thank you, Dr. Charlie Starr. And listeners, please join us next time when we'll continue going further up. And further in. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers.